Hello, everyone. My name is Joshua Gilliland, and I am one of the founding attorneys of the Legal Geeks. With me this evening is Stephen Tolefield, and we're going to take apart the minds of Mandalore. You can say that we're like spelunking, and it's going to be a rip around good time. Stephen, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Um, for those of you who are going to uh, Star Wars Celebration in London next month, today was the day they opened the panel registration um, for the lottery. So people were suitably uh, freaking out and trying to get on in the virtual queue this morning. So fingers crossed for everyone. Yeah, I I do have some FOMO, but <laughs> yeah. going to London is was just not feasible. Sure, uh, yeah. You know, it would have been a lot of fun. I'm glad I have a bunch of friends going, but it's just not not feasible this year. Yeah. Um, yeah. That we'll work see. thing. Yeah, of yeah. course. And we'll see if they announce a new movie, too. That would be really exciting if um, there was some big news from the that first opening panel. That would be amazing. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, I would just hope that they... We've had near misses with Lucasfilm announcing movies that they end up killing. Yeah. And, yeah. And so it's like, stop doing that. I give something the green light and like show that we're going into production next month. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> or we've been in production for six months. Like something show show that top secret Lucas magic that they're they're actually going and things are moving and shaking in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. So fingers crossed. We'll see what happens. But um, that was my exciting Star Wars news for today for sure. But we can officially now it's that we will be at WonderCon for not one but two panels. One panel is on Wednesday. And our friend Stephen, uh, or Steve Chu, is moderating that one with his wife, Kathy Steinman. Great. And a uh, great lineup for to talk about Wednesday. Awesome. And we're heading up the panel on civil rights in the time of Star Wars, focusing on Andor and Kenobi, which just has a few minor civil rights issues and <laughs> living in a totalitarian government. Yep. So. We could call it the absence of civil rights in Star Wars. It'd probably be a more accurate uh, title. But yeah, oh, I'm really excited about the panel. Stuff is coming together great. We'll have um, Judge John Owens with us, which is going to be, or, um, which is going to be awesome. So, yeah, always a rock star. And uh, the planning call that we had, he had some deep thoughts and some really great ideas. So yeah. we'll be there along with Angela's story and Christine Peake, and it's it's going to be a ripper and good time. It's a great so, group. But... Yeah, if you're in Anaheim, come and check us out. Yeah. Uh, debating about staying an extra day and, and going to Disneyland on Monday because Christine hasn't gone and maybe that's something we should do. So okay. let's uh, stay tuned for more. Maybe it'll be legal geeks at Disneyland on Monday. So, so tempting. Yeah, it's like, mm, do we? Anyway, um, more about us uh, doing wish fulfillment, fulfillment. Let's talk about The Mandalorian. <sighs> It's Bunta Eve, and naturally you go to Tatooine. Sure. And was that in The Phantom Menace? Was that a holiday that was referenced in that, in episode I one? I think so. As I recall, it was, that was the Bunta Eve classic, was another one that Anakin competed in, and the, um, yeah, as I recall. Yeah, I don't, I barely remember that, and I haven't <laughs> seen The Phantom Menace in ages. Yeah. So, uh, good callback. These they're really good at working in obscure references that uh, good, good nerd love. So we go to me to Tatooine and we find out that Peli has a racket. Could you walk us through that racket and the legal issues with it? Yeah. Wow. Uh, the, she's um, always sort of been kind of a little bit of a scammer um, in, in the Mandalorian and in the book of Boba Fett, just always kind of, trying to get upsell people maybe and uh, scam them out a little bit of money, but this uh, really takes it to a next level. It looks like she has a uh, pretty clear criminal um, scheme going on with some Jawas who um, they steal parts from unsuspecting land speeder owners and 
resell the the parts back to the owners, repaint it, of course, to make it look like they're different parts, and then charges them the premium for getting the parts so quickly and for the installation of the parts. So that's a pretty clear scheme. There's a lot going on there. Like I said, there's a conspiracy. So um, there's the agreement between her and the Jawas to, um, to commit the larceny, to scam the people out of their money. Um, then, it, like I said, the predicate offense probably a larceny just because it, it's I'm not sure that the prosecutor could show that they had the intent to permanently deprive the owners of their property but it certainly gets it takes their property away from them for some amount of time um, which is a theft offense um, and also just sort of on the civil side I wonder if there's this might be also a um, unfair competition situation where the Rodian owner of the of the um, of the land speeder might be able to sue Pelly and her garage for this sort of fraudulent business practice of stealing parts and then rebuilding someone's car with the stolen parts um, and selling it back to them. Yeah, I do think that would be a good 17200 case in California, which is the unfair business practices and getting into steal the parts, paint them so they look different and put them back on. Like this is, it is the definition of a fraudulent business practice. So good call. And yeah. like watching this scene, it was just like, Pelly, no, no bad. And it's I know that this is, Tatooine is a, you know, the land of villainy and scum, but come on. Like, and on Boota Eve too, where is her holiday spirit? It's, it's, just, it's, just, it's Dickensian almost. You know, what does the great Boonta think of all of this? Like, <laughs> right. She's definitely getting cold. So, uh, yeah, it's just just bad. And I'm like, we got Jawas wearing beads. Like, ah, uh, what happens? Uh, yeah. So, uh, I look forward to an in-depth discussion on whether or not Bunta Eve is a would qualify as a federal holiday if it's religious. What's its cultural significance here? Yeah. It, it certainly defined? seems like it might be a bank holiday because she was talking about having to work on Boonta Eve um, and sounds like businesses are closed and it's certainly a day off for most people. Um, yeah, it seems like there's some significance there for sure. Yeah, so most of the civil courts are closed and it's just like the criminal division with the standby judge. Yeah. They're the signed warrants and, and, you know, do preliminary hearings. So yeah, lots of lots of chaos there. So let, let's talk about R5-D4. Now, first I will say I'm ecstatic that this droid that had an extended cameo in A New Hope is actually getting screen time that's meaningful. Yeah. Uh, apparently it was supposed to be in Kenobi, judging by some of the photos that yeah. from, from the set that uh, they, they didn't use them, but apparently it was supposed to be in that. Yeah. And... Was he had a whole chapter, they, I'm not sure if it's a, um, but they uh, had a whole chapter in um, a certain point of view, right? Yes. In, in the first one, which was great, um, where R5-D4 sort of made a sacrifice so that the so that the R2, the other R2 unit could get chosen. Uh, it was pretty cool. Yeah, so he's not a coward per se, but my word, man, you know, droid up. Uh, <laughs> but so we, we get to Mandalore. And there, there's, first off, the sale of R5 raises questions about misrepresentation and uh, puffery. There's a difference between puffery and fraud mm -hmm. when it comes to making a sale and in selling a used car. And uh, Pelly might have oversold him, and that's worthy of discussion uh, in a blog post. But when we get to Mandalore, you know, he gets sent out to test the air, make sure it's breathable. And he's hesitant, he's afraid. And, uh, you know, Din tells the droid, you know, like, it wasn't a request and, and, you know, pops him out of the, the N1 so he can go test the air. Did Din abuse or torture or any way endanger R5 by doing that? Yeah. Now, now we don't have cruelty to droids legislation on the books. We do have cruelty to animal legis legislation. And right now the droid is acting a lot like a service animal in, in going out. And I thought it'd be a good idea to look at the California 
penal code which, which deals with cruelty to animals. And uh, this is section uh, 597B, which states, except as otherwise provided in some division A or C, every person who overdrives, overloads, drives when overloaded, overworks, tortures, torments, deprives necessity uh, sub of substance, sustenance, drink, or shelter, cruelly beats, mutilates, or cruelly kills any animal or causes or procures any animal to be so overdriven, overloaded, driven when overloaded, overworked, tortured, tormented, deprived, necessary sustenance, drink, shelter, or to be cruelly beaten, mutilated, or cruelly killed, and whoever having the charge of, or custody of any animal, either as owner or otherwise, subjects any animal to needless suffering or inflicts unnecessary cruelty upon the animal, or in any manner abuses any animal or fails to provide the animal with proper food, drink, or shelter, or protection from the weather, or who drives, rides, or otherwise uses the animal when unfit for labor, is for each offense guilty of a crime punishment under subdivision D. Subdivision D states that uh, it could be imprisonment or a fine of not more than $20,000. And uh, it's felony imprisonment at that. Mm. So is R5 being tormented? Yeah. Is he, is he uh, being overdriven? What do you think? He certainly seems unwilling to perform his job. Um, and and I agree that it's probably analogizing him in this situation is probably more closer to kind of a beast of burden or mm -hmm. a, sort of a farm animal that um, doesn't have much choice in the work it's assigned to do. Um, it's certainly not an at-will employment type situation where he could just say, you know what, this job is not for me and walk away from it. Um, so yeah, I, I agree that it's probably... Um, the analogy probably is pretty consistent. Yeah. And, um, and the, and R5 doesn't seem to want to go any closer to the shaft to test the air quality, um, whether he detects the, um, the ambush that's already, that's in there, or if he's just scared of dark <laughs> deep holes, <laughs> which, um, whichever, um, he certainly doesn't seem like he's, he's excited about it. I don't know how, um, I mean, may, maybe if Din understood that there were, there was a peril beyond maybe the atmosphere being toxic to organic beings that, um, like the ambush, maybe if he understood that he was kind of throwing R5 into that kind of peril, um, that might, be a strong case for um for that kind of abuse but it, it seemed like he wasn't he thought that the droid certainly would be qualified to just run some air take some air samples and test it for toxicity so i'm not sure if that alone was enough to qualify as torture yeah i don't think it gets to torture overburdening uh, or denying him sustenance yeah because it's go out and test the air make yeah. sure it won't kill us like don't it's like it it doesn't seem to be any known threats it's not like i need you to go into the nuclear reactor like there isn't that kind of pressure right. there or i want you to tow the n1 that way over the hill like we're not seeing anything like that or i want you to dig through glass get right. out your little drill and get to work little buddy like it's nothing that intense He's harsh, uh, but it's not like he knows of, you know, the droid was beaten by Jawas in the dark, you know, like some traumatic experience that right, he knows yeah. would be triggering. There's nothing like that here. Yeah. It's we sort of, and I, I wonder like how our R5, how qualified R5D4 was for this job too, because that one of the things I sort of had questions about with this episode is Din gave up awfully easily on IG-11 um, or the idea of recreating him or bringing him back to life when he was presented with an alternative in R5-D4. Because um, in the, maybe it was in the previous episode where he said, I really want this droid because he was my friend. Mm -hmm. And then at the beginning of the this episode, he said, I really need a droid who can spelunk and kind of, which um, suggests an agility that an astromech 
maybe doesn't have. Um, so, but then um, he sort of was like, yeah, whatever, I'll take this R5 unit instead, I guess. This is, uh, he seemed like a pretty easy customer for Pele to, to uh, manipulate. But, um, but so I wonder, like, if he, if he just gave up on the idea that the droid was going to go down the shaft, and if it really was just to kind of test the air quality when that wouldn't affect an inorganic um droid i don't know it's, yeah what's is is there a timetable that yeah. he needs to meet or is he just he went wow the jawas can't find it then no one can maybe uh, yeah but i would call boba fett at that point maybe there's something around Jaw jabba's palace yeah that it, it just he does throw in the towel pretty quickly yeah uh, uh, but maybe they're staying with a plan too long. Mm. And maybe that's the situation that he realized with, I got to adopt. Yeah. Like I, I wanted IG-11. I want this done. These guys can't find the part. Maybe I need to adapt my plan. Right. And may maybe that was the realization. Because if not, you can just wait forever, just, you know. Analysis for IG eleven. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Got waiting for IG eleven. Uh yeah. Oh, oh go oh go go, you didn't. Yeah, there was a <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. I I hope he comes back. Uh if not, that's a really wasted Chekhov's gun. Yeah. Um, it seemed like it was really setting up a quest or like at least a side quest for this season that he was gonna like go find that memory thing that wouldn't bring his friend back and he's like yeah i guess not <laughs> that was kind of over so yeah weird yeah maybe he's realizing well again maybe what's the end game uh yeah. maybe he realizes i could still do this and save him maybe yeah yeah uh and like, we don't know how much time's passed as well. Like I, I purposely did not watch the interviews with Favreau and Filoni, but uh, Favreau made a comment that either two years had passed with Luke, which seems like a long period of time. I get like nine months, but two years seems a bit much. Yeah. And that he initially, Grogu and Mando had spent years together. That also seems a bit excessive. Yeah. I mean, I get like 15 months. I don't get years floating around because some of these adventures were in real time. Yeah. And um, there, was some, there was some ambiguity too because the way that that interview was worded, and I didn't read it word for word myself, but it almost also could be read to mean that it had been two years since they had filmed the episodes or something. So it wasn't like in universe years, but um, I don't know. Who knows? All sorts of controversy. Yeah. So time passed and again grogu learned to do flips and i would hope he didn't spend a weekend with luke like because that would be lame for like growth but again nine to you know 16 months that seems reasonable for you know an extended period for din to realize i kind of want to make sure he's okay like yeah. i it was the heat of battle and i didn't get to make sure he went to a nice safe school like he there was late sabers and scariness, and and here we are. Didn't get to go to an open house. No. Check out, check out the cookies. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, part of my uh, wish fulfillment for storytelling was to see an alliance between Luke and Mando, mm. where Mando could help find Jedi younglings, force sense, well, excuse me, force sensitive individuals who might want to become Jedi and and help take them to luke so that way they could be safe and learn the ways of the force and that way din could learn how to use a lightsaber from luke like that that seemed to be like a good plan and right. i'm bummed we didn't get to see something like that yeah uh, but we do get to see a lot of bo katan in action right so for a character who's at least 50 maybe 60 by now <laughs> like, uh, um wow this was kind of her episode so okay din gets captured you cannot have traps for people to defend property 
you, you, it's just you don't get to have landmines and right. a giant bear trap in order to capture a, a, a person there's no way that's legal there's just there's just no way that's legal it's also wrong to eat people you cannot drain them of their bodily fluids Ew, ew, ew. That like that was very triggering for this person who's very prone to vasovagal <laughs> syncope. <laughs> like, I was like, oh, no needles, please. <laughs> Star Wars, just, anything but. <laughs> it's like, oh, oh, this is wrong. So yeah, Din's totally getting. Uh, uh, he's a pin cushion in this episode. Yeah, he's hurting. <laughs> I don't know how much blood he lost, but he lost a healthy amount of blood. So he like he is not on his a game that tube that was draining the blood was like measured in centimeters it was a large <laughs> it was a large tube <laughs> it was like a garden hose yeah that's uh no you don't get to do that so there's there's just no way that it's like well i need to eat no you don't hunt people and whatever that creature was uh very very creepy uh, also, the gargoyle type creatures, I don't remember their names, but that, again, they hunted human beings for for meal prep, and uh, which begs the question, what have they been eating for, you know, 10 years? Yeah, yeah. I can imagine that everything there is very hungry if the plant is completely abandoned. Yeah, and, you know, it's it's, I think, good to talk about the time frame. So this... All right, so the initially Mandalorian was supposed to be seven years after Return of the Jedi. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's, what, nine years after the Battle of Yavin? Or 10, mm -hmm. 10 years after the Battle of Yavin, somewhere in there? Somewhere in there, yeah. And if it's been, let's just say, two years since all of this began, we're looking at uh, 10 to 12 years since the Battle of Yavin. Mm-hmm. The purge in the night of a thousand tears was sometime before the Battle of Yavin. The events of rebels at the beginning was five years before the Battle of Yavin, but I think got up to the latter half, like three, two years, maybe three years before the Battle of Yavin. Yeah, and then the epilogue was after. After, yeah. immediately, sometime after Jedi. Yeah. So Mandalore gets nuked sometime after Rebels and before Battle of Yavin. Maybe even after Battle of Yavin. Uh, you know, for how long they they hold out and they're fighting. So mm -hmm. they've been nuked. That planet's been wrecked for anywhere from 10 to 14 years. Yeah. Uh, and again, this is this is all guessing for how long they've been it's been rubble, but it's not 20 years. So it's, unless it got nuked in rebels and we did, or before rebels and we didn't know. Yeah. It's hard to know too, because you would think that um, they would be able to tell whether that, like, it seems strange that no one went to Mandalore to try to figure out if there's anything left, especially with the resources valuable as Beskar on it, but, um, you know, Star Wars. Yeah, <laughs> the narrative like, is always more important. <laughs> it's, you know, Earth has 7 billion people on it. How many were on Mandalore? Yeah. You know, it was just, how many Mandalorians or biological Mandalorians are left? Um, yeah, there's so many good questions here. Um, <laughs> what happened? And no one thought to send a probe. No one thought to send a droid. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so anyway. I guess that... legends of being cursed, I guess, were enough to deter people from um, checking it out. Yeah. We'll get. So, Bo is sulking and uh, she sees the N1 coming back and goes, hey, I'm going to go tell him off. And, and she goes from, um, you know, I'm on the war path to maternal, what the happened here? Because again, when the cute little kid comes out all alone, 
she she had the character uh, to go, oh, oh, this is not a okay he isn't here to know annoy me the kid came back because something bad happened right and her she has a good hero's journey in this episode with the switching from sulky upset to hero mode and then you know conclusion of a matter of faith kicking into gear as well but out of the gate when grogu appears the question is, does Bo-Katan have a duty to rescue the Mandalorian for the first time? And technically, the answer to that is no. There's right. no special relationship between them. There's no contractual relationship between them. There's no statutory reason for, for her to go. She goes because she's a hero and realizes, okay, this guy might annoy me, but something bad has happened. And I'm going to go lend a hand. So she she powers up her spaceship and takes R5 and the kid and goes to go save the day. Any any other thoughts to add on this? Yeah, I was thinking because if you're there, there generally is a common law, no duty to rescue people, even if it seems like it's really would be really easy for someone to help or um, but you just don't have that duty. Um, other than a moral one, maybe. But sometimes if you create the danger, sometimes you have an obligation to protect people from the danger you've created. So I was trying to, I, I rewatched the end of the episode one to see if she had somehow encouraged him to go or something. But she was really like, you shouldn't go, but if you really want to be my guest. So it's not like she provoked him into going really um, or created a, a danger or, you know, any sort of fiduciary relationship where he's relying on her, um, on her promises that it's going to be okay. So, um, so yeah, I agree. I don't really think there's really any duty for her to get in the ship, but obviously the right thing to do, um, especially when Grogu shows up, what else are you going to do? Those big black empty eyes. <laughs> he looks scared and concerned. Like, what do you... His little ears all like droopy <laughs> no one says no to that it's like <sighs> yeah Fine. and you uh, was was there the realization of like i was super mean a minute ago and i am sorry i am i'm glad no one saw that but the droid okay don't mention that to anyone and you give it at risk memory units <laughs> that, that might get erased really quickly <laughs> i want you to delete the last three minutes yeah. we will never discuss this again <laughs> i was wrong <laughs> and and here i go and so she saves the mandalorian there is no legal reason for her to do so but it is super awesome to watch it's i don't know who the stunt person was i don't know if katie sackhoff does any of her own stunts but it was super cool the way she handles the dark saber rocks hard and right especially team. yeah especially after we just saw din struggle with its weight we know that you know if it it's a burden to people for whom it's not really intended until they grow into it but Bo-Katan seems to have no problem um, wielding the dark saber. Um, it's like a butter knife through that um, through that scary droid. Um, so yeah, she's she's all she's ready for the dark saber for sure. Um, it's just not hers to claim yet. That and it's like we saw uh, Sabine learn how to use it from Kanan. Right. Yeah. And and Sabine had a really hard time with it as well and in like goes through an emotional journey and learning how to to use it by first practicing with Ezra which gets sloppy and then Kanan doing dad mode and teaching her how to, how to use it did Bo-Katan get lessons from uh, Sabine like how did this all work out like what was you know, I don't need a flashback but it's she she learned how to use it right yeah somewhere and it looks it really suited her for sure she was able to wield it really um really expertly yeah it was awesome uh it was <laughs> it was very cool uh but thinking back to book of boba fett din didn't have problems fighting the droid right so does does he have like confidence issues with it like what's going on here because he didn't have the weight issue while fighting 
the the battle droid that that came out so are we just supposed to forget that or is this just a like he rose up to the moment and didn't have a problem with it Hmm. was he saddled with some fear with trying to find the waters what's right there's something else going on yeah or or is it just self-doubt because he's fighting four scary monsters right at the at, at, again because of star wars at a very scary precipice that overlooks with no guardrail of course so yeah that was a very scary situation and i want and it maybe perhaps the fact that the dark saber was back on mandalore there was some reaction to the, the physical space something who knows i mean he had just talked with bo katan you know mm-hmm. who made the comment about go wave that around and they'll follow you maybe he's thinking about that of like i don't want to lead <laughs> And like this i didn't sign up for this so like i don't know if i can do this like maybe that's weighing on him as well so there could be a lot of internal struggle going on of like what's my destiny here am i supposed to you know i went from loner to leading a community like is that what i'm supposed to do now yeah so there's a lot there and i hope we find out now fun issue was while he's convalescing and she makes pog soup uh she decides to join him in his mission to help him and that made me wonder did they form a valid partnership Hmm. and pulling from my analysis on whether or not indiana jones and marion ravenwood had a partnership and the answer to that one was yes Hmm because there's an exchange of money and she says I'm your goddamn partner that's actually a valid partnership under Connecticut law so let's look at Connecticut law again and all the essential elements for a partnership is the association of two or more persons to carry on as co-owners of a business for profit forms a partnership whether or not the persons intend to form a partnership and that's from Hirschfield v Hirschfield 50 Connecticut app, 280 at 287. And that's uh, from 1998. So thinking back to this scene, what do you think, Stephen? I guess my only, um, the only box that doesn't seem like it's easily ticked is the uh, business purpose or the, um, the, um, the for-profit it cer- certainly seems like his mission is to is kind of a religious pilgrimage as opposed to a, an enterprise that um, she's assisting him with so i'm not sure that that would be um that would qualify for that element what about you i don't know uh i think it's i i would want to get into more case law to mm. see if that religious pilgrimage could make it work maybe you know and i mean does that create a special relationship for them for a duty to rescue because part of the analysis is if if they have a partnership they become fiduciaries to each other yeah yeah maybe maybe the profit is broadly defined as sort of anything of value and he's certainly invested um you know the the cost of purchasing r five d four the fuel to get there. Um, it seems like there's some money on the line, at least on his side. So who knows? Yeah, so there's I think there could be um, something there, but it, it would require more legal analysis. And I haven't had the time to jump into that, but I'm curious, and we'll see if I get a little free time. Well, and the, it looks like at the end of the episode, they're still together. So if they do have a partnership, it seems like the partnership will continue into week three. So it might be something to address next week, too. Yeah, I'm, yes. Because she, if they find the living waters, that is huge to their culture. Yeah. And can that be, is that enough? And I don't know. I mean, like it's when we get there I and mean, just to focus on uh, this is like kind of leaving legal but it's a baptism of sorts and we find out that she recited the creed when you know as being the little princess and 
literally, uh, not figuratively, when she was a little princess, she recited the creed, made her dad proud. Mm -hmm. And you see her like, getting in touch with her faith once again, or at least being reminded of it. Like, I grew up Lutheran, so it's like hearing the Apostles' Creed, uh, you know, like still has meaning for yeah. uh, for its symbolism. Mm -hmm. And it looks like she's getting emotionally affected by those connections to it. Yeah. And then in the water, she does have sort of an encounter that could be characterized as almost a religion, a religious encounter. Yeah. Yeah, so which brings us to Din not realizing there isn't an extra step and and stepping off. And since he's wearing a big anchor, right. free, free falls. He drops like a rock, doesn't he? And and she she has to catch up with him by using her rocket. So she has to like make up some speed. <laughs> like how heavy is that Beskar or the maybe the dark saber is that heavy that it pulled him down that fast? But he took that off. He took off the gun and the dark saber yeah. and the jet pack. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's not like he just stripped down to a swimsuit and helmet. Right. He, which again would have been hysterical. But uh you and know, he went he, down far. Yeah. <laughs> it's like and fast. Oh, that's that's heavy. Yeah. Uh, and I wondered, I, did the Mythosaur pull him under? Was there was, was there an implication that that happened? I was kind of confused about how he got so far down so fast. Um, but who knows? Maybe he just dropped that fast. I've seen some, some I've listened to some podcasters who think he was pulled. Uh, I don't necessarily think that. Mm. that. I think he just took a step and sank like a rock. If you ever dropped anything accidentally over the side of a boat, it goes down fast. Yeah, it does. Yeah. So it's not, it's it's gone now. Bye. Um, you know, catching up to it is not easy. Uh did she have a duty to rescue him that time? Hmm. There might be a special relationship if there is a partnership. Yeah. So that one it slides into the maybe category. Yeah. Like as long as it's you're not endangering yourself uh, in order to do it. Cool. But he sinks like a rock. And then on the way up, she sees the mythosaur, which I had forgotten the um, armor making the comment about the mythosaur rising again from the living waters and leading a new age. Right. Yeah. It's like, okay, they're going there. Yeah. Okay. Right. It seems like this might turn into Bo Katan's quest too, because if if she perceives herself as the new as the new Mandalore, the new leader of Mandalore, this is an opportunity for her to capture that um that cachet. Yeah, because and and also get multiple faith systems at play. Being able to go, okay, the mythosaur has risen. So Granted, the, the Venn diagram might be a circle. Those who follow the, the person with the dark saber, but the, again, that's a thousand year old weapon. Mm -hmm. But you have a older parable about the mythosaur rising up from the depths. That should get the Venn diagram of Mandalorians out there to come home. Because yeah. you have both factors in, in play. Now, I'm not saying that's any basis for a system of government. <laughs> but it is a basis to unite people and then you can form a government based upon that right um, unity for sure yeah because Bo needs to get back in touch with with some of the traditions and culture and those who follow the armor need to mellow out a whole heck of a lot so they if, if both can come together uh, they could probably make some necessary reforms so that they're not displaced across the galaxy. So mm -hmm. I'm curious to see which direction they take. Also, just how long do those things live? Right. And because the the myth of the, well, or the story of the, or the legend of Mandalore, wasn't it that he killed a mythosaur, right? Because um, that's how the skull became the symbol of Mandalore, right? It was like he... I think back to um, Quill 
making the comment about like taming a mythosaur or something Reading like that. Mythosaur. Your ancestors wrote, yeah, you're right. So if they, I didn't realize they were that big. Yeah. yeah okay. I, you know, I thought it would be, again, from what Quill said, it sounded like it's, it was something that flew. Yeah. This is something else. This is Godzilla sized kaiju in comparison of you wouldn't want it mad at you right and it's it's very big are they all that big or is this thing like you know five thousand years old and just has been growing the other entire time and they're usually the size of a bantha yeah like, what are we dealing what, <laughs> what are we dealing with yeah um, so i will we'll find out i mean like they can't just flash that i mean the fact that you know, watching with the caption, she gasps and you see like air bubbles come out of the helmet. So right. that, that's not a gasp. That's more like a scream right. of, of, uh, of of swearing out loud type of reaction of she was not expecting a, a myth to myth to come out of the water. So mm -hmm. it's like Chekhov's mythosaur. That's yeah, like come back. <laughs> you don't show you don't show Mythosaur in the ep second episode without seeing the full thing at some point. Yeah, it's like it's it's way bigger than other creatures we've seen. <laughs> like it's it's the space worm in Empire Strikes Back, big. Uh, uh, maybe crate dragon, big. You know, it's it's a very large animal kaiju something yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean star wars has kaiju like, for sure they've had it for a long time yep poloni goes to godzilla fast like mm -hmm. this is not like these guys love the stuff so but yeah i was not ex i was expecting something like a gorilla not right not a mountain so uh, if it's the last of his kind, that can bring us to endangered species status, but I'm sure we'll find out. And are there other oceans where those things could be hanging out? Doesn't make swimming on Mandalore sound very inviting, for sure. No, are like, are they friendly? Like, what's the... <laughs> it's like you swim a log and one pops up. I mean... Like, do you... <laughs> yeah it's like hello little guy like i mean like are they like are they like big manatees or are they like alligators like one you want to hang out with because it won't kill you unless you mess with it and the other is you're you're a snack um yeah. so so anyway lots of good stuff uh any other thoughts on this episode no, I mean, I think obviously the theme of the Mandalorian, of course, is just child endangerment from start to finish, <laughs> you know, pretty much putting a child in situations where they clearly should not be. Um, but again, that's part of the, I feel like that's kind of a constant theme in, in Star Wars is that wish fulfillment of children to have an adventure and do really dangerous things and have ha have lightsaber fights and pew 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 and and so having kids involved in these really um dangerous situations where they that they shouldn't be anywhere near is part of the the um, dna of, of star wars stories so it's hard to fault them too much but it is funny when he's just like hey kid let's just go to this toxic planet that might have a toxic atmosphere and then see what happens it'll be fun right they did test the air first before letting him out but it did not test for cannibals apparently though no and that's that's the wild card because you can't baby proof a planet right and uh, would it have made more sense to have left him with boba yeah like, i, <laughs> I don't know about that either <laughs> pretty much every no one is a great pet like as putting aside like um in um kenobi uh the the skywalkers they're pretty good parents but uh, <laughs> otherwise not a not a lot of good parent stories no it, um, if he had gone to boba and says like hey could fennec come with me like or could you could the kids stay here like either one of those would have would have been smarter don't you have other friends that you could have 
asked to to go on the adventure. He's an apostate now, apostate at this point. He's yeah. he's got no friends. He's an outcast. So it's yeah. his plan of two. But he doesn't have Mandalorian friends who want to hang out with him. Sure. Except for well, he doesn't want he doesn't have Mandalorian friends who are the religious fanatics want to hang out with him. Right. But he has non-Mando friends that he could call up. So again, there's well, yeah, there's a lot to to wonder about the future because I we got to see IG Eleven up and running now. So there'll be yeah. a quest to find the chip mm-hmm. if he's he's been blessed so he can be forgiven for his sins. And uh, do they try instituting reforms of some kind? So like, what's and you don't need to live live on the planet with the alligator turtle monsters that want to eat you. You could have a really nice track of land on Navarro and and everyone be happy. Uh, you guys are law enforcement now. So it's delightful. Yeah, it's just <laughs> everybody wins. <laughs> right. Yeah. But Grogu found his courage in this episode too. He was very scared and learned he applied his Jedi lessons to not be afraid and to be brave and to help people that need him. It was great. That was a cool little moment too. That and it wasn't overkill with he couldn't open the cage. Because <laughs> while he is smarter, uh he, he couldn't figure out like, is there a button to push? Like he he didn't know what to do there. Yeah. But knowing what moon to go to was good. He's learning to be a navigator, just like Mandalorian taught him know where he is yeah and he like knew what part of the planet to go to and Mm -hmm. i'm sure r5 figured that part out too of like i probably should go back we've lost my human we got to go (laughs) right handy to have an astromech after all and not an assassin droid no but the assassin droid probably would have solved the problem differently yeah maybe (laughs) good point good point (laughs) different conflict resolution (laughs) so but they still might not, uh, the, without Bo, he might not have found the living waters. True. So he might have gotten out of the mess of the cannibal cyborg, mm. but still had the issue of where is the civic center and where are the living waters? And then does he da- die by drowning? Right. You know, you know, so yeah, it's just or does Grogu use the force to pull him out of the water is yeah a lot of a lot of storytelling options but I enjoyed seeing this being a Bo-Katan centric episode yeah it was great so with that we're behind on Picard and Bad Batch so stay tuned for us catching up and uh yeah we live in a glorious time where there's no shortage of content uh for us to be able to talk so so with that everyone wherever you listen we appreciate reviews and uh, preferably positive reviews. Give us five stars, share with your friends and wherever you are, stay safe, stay healthy. And of course, stay geeky. Take care, everybody.